the third presentation offers a vision of strategic infrastructure projects aligned with interpretations of Guyana's national development, low carbon de development, and the green state development strategies. So you know we've, we've heard of this green state development strategy, but in terms of an action plan, that is still, I believe, a work in progress. Uh, Stuart is going to offer his own concept of what are the kinds of infrastructure projects that will be necessary if we truly are going to be um, looking at, in a very strategic sense, um, design, construction, maintenance of strategic infrastructure, including the, sorry, the interpretations of Guyana's national development and the Green State Development Strategies. Stuart is a civil engineer and transportation professional. He attended St. Stanislaus College from 1980 to 1987, and after successfully completing his advanced levels at Saints, he pursued further studies in the United Kingdom. He graduated from University College in London with an honors degree in civil engineering and went on to do his master's in structural engineering at the Imperial College London. He has attended numerous postgraduate courses in public-private partnerships, procurement, road network planning and management, and the industry-renowned executive program, Infrastructure in a Market Economy, at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. He worked as a development professional at the Inter-American Development Bank for several years before joining one of the leading UK consulting firms, Mott MacDonald. He has worked on projects in Guyana, the Caribbean, and Africa. Short returned to Guyana in 2014 and is currently project director at SRK Engineering, a leading local consulting engineering firm. Um, my presentation this evening is looking at perhaps the infrastructure that can support the policy statements and aspirations as they're captured in the Green State Development Strategy. Basically going to run through what the Green State uh, Development Strategy entails and within the strategy there are sort of uh, aspirations for energy and renewable energy, uh, infrastructure to support the Green State Development Strategy and then perhaps looking at uh, how you can possibly finance some of the um, projects and the infrastructure, the strategic infrastructure that um, uh, well, my interpretation of what basically perhaps is needed and is articulated in terms of policy in the Green State Development Strategy, and then, of course, perhaps looking at uh, some institutional arrangements. Um, a brief history of uh, sort of development plans, and I, doing my research for this presentation, I sort of uh, had discussions with about two or three uh, professionals uh, in the infrastructure sector who have practiced their uh, profession over a number of decades. Uh, one of whom is, is sitting right here, Engineer Joe Holder. I also spoke with Major General and a few um, other people on um, whether or what was in fact the development plan and strategy or development plans and strategies of Guyana going back to sort of pre-independence. So in the sort of pre-independence period, I gather that there was um, an economic development plan sometime in the 1950s. Um, not too clear what the duration of that plan was, or indeed um, how successful um, it wa they were in terms of implementing the various policies and objectives of that plan. Apparently it was funded by the World Bank. Um, during that period as well, towards Agave, the latter half of the 1950s, the whole focus on development was more on developing our agriculture. So a number of, I think, uh, drainage and irrigation schemes, in particular the Black Bush Boulder, um, they were developed in, in the sort of latter half of the 1950s into the first couple of years of uh, the 1960s. Um, of course, there was a uh, change in government in 1964, and the focus apparently then changed from necessarily investing in agriculture and rural development to uh, developing our road network so that we connect the various parts of our country. 
But I gather that from, in terms of independence in 1966 to 2000, there wasn't any clearly articulated multi-year strategic plan. Instead, you had a number of uh, initiatives which did lead to development. Um, for instance, you had the fee flows and how was the nation. Uh, there was uh, highways to happiness, which I think was the sort of driver of a number of um, road developments which led to the development of the East Coast Highway, Quarantine Highway, and a number of roads which we currently have. Of course, there was the Upper Mazaruni uh, development project upon which we were then trying to develop um, you know, an aluminum smelter and to try and add value to our uh, commodity-based economy at the time. Um, the economy then, of course, went into a bit of a decline in the 80s. Um, President Hoyt then, of course, embarked on the economic recovery program. Um, but basically, there wasn't, as I mentioned, any sort of um, long-term 15, 20-year development strategy. So any project really will have to involve either a sort of a slow turbine, slow rotating turbines, or having extremely long rotors, diameter <coughs> rotors, for you to be able to have um, a successful win. So it's, it's very interesting, a private developer, entrepreneur has jumped in, he is confident that he's going to be able to generate 14 to 16 megawatts. So this is an opportunity as well, I guess, a bit of a pilot project for us to actually see how this functions. In terms of small solar, there are a number of communities, Region 1, Region 2, th uh, 7, 8, and 9, where they're putting in these small uh, 15 kilowatt um, photovoltaic, and they're looking at sort of hybrid systems in, in the larger sort of communities. So, so um, on to goal number three. This is the extremely ambitious one, where um, the Green State Development Strategy aims to have 100% renewables by 2025. Very quickly, our current demand is approximately 140 megawatts. Um, future, the projected demand in 2035 is more than double, um, double that, going up to 300. Existing installed capacity in the Demerara, Burbis interconnected system, 130 megs in Demerara, 60 in Burbis, a total of 190. So we're moving from a system that has 190 megawatts of sort of hydrocarbon generated power to one which will have 300 plus you have to um, add for peaking. So you're talking probably about 350 megawatts. So we have to change out all of that and create that much in renewables. Huh? So it's all order ahead of us. Um, this is a study that was done in 2014 initially. It was updated in 2016 where um, they looked at how can we actually get um, or meet our future um, generation uh, needs. They looked at a number of hydros, uh, Kamaira, Myla, Tiger Hill, uh, Chimashi, Mari, Kumarao. They looked also at your traditional sort of hydrocarbons. They even looked at coal, um, biomass, wind. And at the time, of course, there wasn't much talk about bringing uh, gas to shore for a gas fire power plant but they did look at the gas turbine. 
Just quickly, in terms of if we're talking really renewable energy, um, in terms of carbon emissions, uh, the hydros give you um, probably about 20 tons per uh, gigawatt hour. Um, hydrocarbons, of course, 700, biomass zero, wind zero. And so with gas, which is what's being discussed now, uh, as in terms of a, a clean, before the, uh, clean before green, it's actually um, not that clean because 688 tons compared to 700. But, um, but yeah, so in sort of moving towards renewables, it will have to be some mix of these um, as we move forward. So in terms of green state development, again, it makes these grand statements and aspirations in terms of policy. I won't read them in, in the interest of time. But basically, this one here, um, intercity, this is the key one, because the president says that he would like to basically connect all our municipalities. It's, it's captured in the Green State Development Strategy. How do we do this? This was just a table which I created myself, which looked at our 10 municipalities, and basically whether you can drive from one town to another. And essentially, you can drive from nine towns, but obviously the new town, Mabaruma, you cannot drive from Mabaruma anywhere. So I, uh, I think that should be a priority project. What would it look like? Um, it's basically a road. We'll have to build a road from Supernam to Bokal. Then there's an existing trail from Bokal, which Barama developed, up to Machu's Ridge, Port Kaituma, Wano, um, Wanaina, into Mabaruma. It's about 300 km of engineered gravel road. However, the good thing is that about 250 km already exists to be just upgrading, and a 50 km section from Port Kaituma to Yarakita would need to be built. This is what it looks like in a map. We have to construct a bit from Supernam to Bakal. This exists in, in different states, however, so it just needs to be upgraded. There's a little bit um, that needs to be built out to connect to Machu's Ridge. Machu's Ridge to Port Kaituma exists. A little bit needs to be built out to Arquita, and the Arquita to Mabaruma exists. So this would then bring Mabaruma, which is now a declared town, into the main road network so that you will have complete connectivity between all 10 of our towns. Um, looking at it in a more qualitative basis, uh, between the towns again, where it's green, you have a paved road connection, where it's yellow, it's a gravel road, and where it's red, basically there is no um, connection. So, and Stanley touched on this project already. This is um, basically the Farika Macauri Goshen Monkey Jump. Um, another alternative, which perhaps is lower cost, is Linden Robin Monkey Jump Bartica. Um, we'll have to basically rehabilitate the Bartica Batara Road, which I think is ongoing, and upgrade the Linden Letham Road. Again, in a map, um, Stanley obviously showed this much more eloquently than this map does. But Parika to Goshen to Monkey Jump, a bridge across at Monkey Jump, then across the Bartica. But as I said, we already have a built-out road, paved road to Linden. Another alternative, if, um, which may be lower cost, is just doing Linden Rocks to a multi jump and across there. Um, um, in terms of road network expansion, um, again, Stanley spoke about Diamond to Ogle, so I won't um, spend much time on this slide. But essentially, this entire area is congested. We have no capacity here, so we're going to create that capacity in a parallel road. Um, so that the, this conurbation of Grove Diamond can quickly get to Georgetown where everyone wants to get to. Um, in terms of West Bank, a uh, traffic study was actually, sorry, traffic count was done at Breed and Hoop in May of last year. And believe it or not, we have 25,000 vehicles per day that transit that intersection. Um, and anyone who drives along that road early in the morning at peak hours will know that you have sort of congestion in that whole Breed and Hoop plant in Walk area. So again, Stanley picked this one up. We need to build a bypass um, of that whole green and hoop area, which then opens up all these lands there. Um, New, Harbor. Um, New Harbor Bridge, we touched on this. We had a presentation three weeks ago. This is just um, a four-lane high-level option at um, Peters Hall. So I guess we can all dream. Um, <laughs> hopefully this may indeed yet happen. Um, so in terms of international connectivity, GSDS speaks about reliance on access by road to neighboring countries. Again, we have, again, where is green, you have a paved road. So we have a paved road to Suriname, we have a fair weather road to Brazil, and there is no road to Venezuela. So that would be, um, so you have two priority projects that's coming out of that, upgrading the Linden Letham Road, which is obviously being looked at. 
but more importantly, the second one is a road to Venezuela. And you probably have two options here, one going on the Piuni Mazaruni watershed, i.e. the Peruni, uh, the old of them are our upper Mazaruni development road, um, but continuing it at Mbaman and Toco and, and San Martin in, in Venezuela. Option two is continuing the Bacal Mabaruma road, which I showed earlier, and just uh, putting a spur. This is what it looks like. So again, you're already building out to our one project could be built out to Mar uh, Marches Ridge. So you will just have to build this section here, which passes through Five Star and hooks up with Bochaniche in, in Venezuela, which is already connected to the Venezuela road network. This option will serve all those mining communities, Five Star, Arakaka, Marches Ridge, Barometa. So you will have good feasibility uh, for this road. Um, Second option is coming down on the old Upper Mazaruni Development Project Road, which, which Mr. Wolder worked on, um, and basically just building out this new leg, upgrading this, building this out to Etringba, and uh, connecting with San Martin on the upside. Um, urban settlements, um, very quickly, these are all quite self-evident projects which need to be done. Um, however, to improve into urban sort of or urban transport. There's currently a study on the way, sustainable urban transport study, which is looking at how we can improve urban transport. But one option, and um, well, we certainly need to introduce some sort of mass transit system because I think the current system of, of minibuses has probably outlived its usefulness. Um, it certainly served its purpose when it was first um, when it first started, but um, I think that it's uh, creating more congestion and uh, in the system than than providing useful service. So one option is obviously bus rapid transit. Um, basically BRT is buses running on dedicated lanes. You can either have shared or exclusive road infrastructure uh, in terms of renewables, the LNG powered. And this is a, uh, an example of a shared um, road space with the BRT with a dedicated lane. This is exclusive. In terms of Guyana, we can perhaps have shared along this new road. Um, we can have exclusive along the railway embankment if it's converted into sort of um, a priority route. Um, how do we finance all of this? Um, GSDS actually speaks about um, official development aid. So on average, it's about 100, 180 million per annum. There was a peak of 256 million in 1997. Private finance, apparently the six local commercial banks have assets of 98% of our GDP. Uh, Non-financials have 42% and our insurance companies have 17%. So in the private sector, there's um, a fair amount of assets which uh, perhaps are available for um, funding infrastructure. There are of course fiscal revenues and as we move towards um, an oil and gas uh, economy, we uh, can tap into funds from a sovereign wealth fund. Um, Summarizing these projects, again, uh, this is just a potential funding source, uh, entirely my interpretation. You can use overseas development, a uh, combination of PPPs, sovereign wealth funds, uh, sort of indicative costs. And I basically included this column here to see whether these projects were in fact considered before, and of course they were. Um, I think our problem in Guyana is not actually conceptualizing the projects. Because if you go back to 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of these projects were talked about. Road to Letham was in fact uh, captured in the study in 1961. So it's not exactly new. Our problem is not conceptualizing projects. Our problem in Guyana is actually building them out. And I think uh, one um, reason is for, this, for this is that we do not have um, a national infrastructure plan that has national consensus and which transcends political cycles. So I think what we really need is a subset of the GNDS, is a national infrastructure plan, which um, again has widespread consultation, national consensus, parliamentary approval, so that if there are indeed changes in government, we don't go rushing from one project to another, given the length of time it takes to actually develop um, these large projects. 
that um, plan will need a home. There are various options. You can have an authority, you can have a national infrastructure company like they do in Trinidad, or you can have a commission which actually is answerable to the parliament. But um, I think we, we need to recognize that the current, infrastructure, uh, the current institutional arrangements are perhaps not working. And given the development program we have and the scale of those projects, we need to have um, a new system. So in summary, GSDS identifies need for substantial investment. Financing can be sourced from a combination of public, private, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, we certainly need a national infrastructure plan uh, with the commission if we are to go. I was looking for a photo that uh, said old life and good life. But I only found, I only found old life and new life. So um, yeah, uh, but we will certainly need to do these things if we intend to move to a new life. That's just the